All right, guys, so if we're recording live, I'd like to say hi to everybody out there at the quarry watching us live and anybody else out there in TV land. Uh, my name's Jacob Hill, and we're going to be doing a uh, Let's Get Tanked seminar tonight. It's going to cover everything about tanks, some stuff you might know, some stuff you might not know. All right, so what we're going to cover this is a little bit of a uh, little bit of history. The tanks of today, advantages of steel versus aluminum, high pressure versus low pressure, a little bit of red redundancy, and cost effectiveness. If any time anybody has any questions, like I said, this is supposed to be kind of a give and take. If you've got an experience, by all means, please share it or discuss it and put it out there. All right. All right. I used a couple different resources for this lecture. Uh, the Inspecting Cylinders publication by William Hyde. He's the guy that writes everything for visual uh, inspections. He's with PSI and PCI. Uh, the NOAA Diving Manual, and then also as well as the U.S. Navy Diving Manual covered a lot of this information. A little bit of the history. So in 1866, the first demand regula regulator was developed, um, but it was kind of limited because they didn't have the technology to cover high pressure cylinders yet. Uh, in 1933, they came out with the first high pressure cylinder. It was a French guy named Le Preur. I can't pronounce it, I'm not French. Um, and then in 1943, Jacques Cousteau developed the Aqualung where he paired a advanced first stage with a modern tank achieving that high pressure and that basically gave us what we have today. Okay, This is one of the original uh, Cousteau ads for the Aqualung. Um, pulled that out of an archive so I figured I'd share it with you. Alright, All right. so tanks of the past. Big thing we hear, and again some of you guys being a little older, certified before I was born, I'm sorry. Um, there was a series of tanks that were developed by Luxfer, they were made of 6351. Uh, this is the type of tank uh, that's prone to the sustained load cracking. Uh, a lot of people say, hey, we can't service those anymore, we can't hydro those anymore, we won't visual inspect them, and they want to condemn them. Truth is, that's not the case. Uh, they are still widely proliferated uh, out there in the diving world today. Uh, they just require what they call an eddy current. Uh, basically, just a, it's a series of threading tools that, that go through and they measure for any cracks within, within the threading of the tank. All right. You have your Grandpa Steel 72, they're still widely proliferated, in fact I own two that are a decade older than me, um, and they're still widely used and they're great tanks. Uh, J-valves, so before submersible pressure gauges, you had a J-valve like this one up here. That, that allowed you to use a reserve portion of your tank, uh, basically down to 500 psi, it was enough to get the diver back to the surface. I'm going to do this again. Unless you have my fingerprint. <laughs> Can I have it? <laughs> Next slide. All right, going over tanks of today. So the industry standard for aluminum tanks is 6061 alloy. It doesn't require an eddy current. They're widely proliferated. They come in about 100 different shapes and sizes. Uh, as you can see here, everything from a small six to 120 cubic feet, okay? Uh, modern uh, steel cylinders, again, expanded options. Back then, limited to that 72. They had smaller than that, uh, but since then they've gotten larger. They've had included rounded bottoms. Uh, everything's gone to a modern cave out, which is what we see most common today. There's no reserve lever. It's got the burst disc on the back, O-ring on the surface. Yeah, you're good. We'll get this ironed out, bud. <laughs> <laughs> Windows. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, then we wouldn't be doing anything. <laughs> Blue screen of death. Other types of valves out there, we've got DIN valves. Have everybody seen the DIN valve before? Mm -hmm. This is the one that threads in. Okay, those were adopted from Europe um, just because of their European standard. Uh, they become very common in the tech world for us uh, as it encapsulates that O ring inside, creating a, a tighter bond and seal. Average working pressures is between 2250 and 3000 PSI. We'll talk a little bit about those working pressures a little further in the, in the briefing. Next slide. All right, tank identification. Anybody seen those little hieroglyphics around the crown of the tank? Did you know those meant something? Do you know how to decipher them? It's taken me a long time to learn. I'm still not very good at it. I asked Paul. A lot of times the only thing, thing you can do is if you can figure out the manufacturer of that tank, look. Look up the manufacturer online and get their key because um, a lot of them are just like, they're just on their own program. That's true. I didn't know that you could look it up that easily, but yeah, it's true. I, I found out one of my tanks has TP plus a four-digit number. Uh -huh. 
I'm always by looking pressure. at the manufacturer. It's not it's a test pressure. It's something else. No, it's a test pressure. Test pressure. Test pressure. Yeah. DOT, DOT codes are going to be universal on all the tanks, and they should be, the TP is always the test pressure. If it's, It should be for right. 34 well, maybe, it's maybe it's not the uh, Well, maybe it's not the test pressure, but it was definitely uh, something. I can bring it in and show Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. And it, it definitely, um, there, some of them do have some really weird stuff, and that's usually manufacturer specific, but the DOT stuff is always the same. It'll always say, now if it's a European tank, which I have seen come through, they have some weird stuff, because they're just weird. But, um, good, okay, no problem. That's good. Um, so like Paul said, all the tanks in the United States are regulated by DOT. Uh, they all have ex exact specifications of how they were manufactured. Um, like you had mentioned, that there's a lot of different things out there. Truth is, there's only like three or four companies that manufacture tanks, but they get distributed and they sold, get sold and marketed through different companies like Scuba Pro, Aqualung, etc. And that's why it may be an Aqualung tank, but it was actually built by Lux4, just for example. A couple of the big uh, tank identification markings. So on a steel cylinder and aluminum cylinder, they're slightly different. Talking about a steel cylinder, you've got your manufacturing code. So this one was made by Pacific uh, Press Steel, um, PST. It was distributed by Decor. You'll see on there somewhere a symbol that looks like this. And the oldest one, this is the year, this would be the year the tank was manufactured, okay? Serial number for the tank, Working pressure, 2250, and then these various codes will have to do with who hydroed that tank and who inspected it. Similarly, on the, st on the aluminum side, you've got 3AL, which specifies that 31, or I'm sorry, 61. Yeah, it's aluminum. 3AA, so AA is always steel, and then three, the AL is aluminum. Yep. Okay. Now, what you might see in the, um, instead of that 3AL, which some, the symbolic for the 6061, the you might see an exemption code, and that would tell you that if that tank was made out of that older uh, materials, that it's susceptible to that sustained load crack, cracking. Does that make sense? Uh, cylinder volume, size like that. I've got a variety of tanks that I've found in my travels. None of them are the same, but obviously at first looking at it, I want to know how big it is, and that's how you can identify it. If you break that down and pull up one of these references, you can identify that tank. Go ahead. Thank you. All right, so material. You've got steel and aluminum out there. Pros and cons to both. Uh, this is going to be the common standard. For a while back, uh, several years ago, Russia was playing with titanium tanks working at high pressures of 4,500 PSI. They didn't get through DOT, it, and they just kind of died out. So the industry standard is steel and aluminum. Pros to steel, they uh, most commonly are low pressure tanks. What that equates to is that in order to achieve that volume, it is sustained through lower pressures. Uh, if you're on a dive boat that has an air compressor on board that may not get 3,000 PSI, well, if you had an aluminum 80 at 3,000 PSI, you'd get a short fill. But if I've got a steel 80 that's 2250, we cannot probably achieve that full fill. Um, most tanks, most steel tanks are going to be negatively buoyant. They're going to have a longer life. Uh, you do have an overfill option, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. The cons of it, steel tanks can be kind of expensive and they're susceptible uh, to corrosion in the form of iron oxide, um, which can be a little damaging, but not a big deal, it can be mitigated. On the aluminum side of things, they're relatively inexpensive. If I was a dive shop or if I was a uh, live aboard, I'd have a whole fleet of 80s because they're inexpensive, they're easy to work on, and they're just kind of the industry strand standard. The cons to that, they're all high pressure, relatively at 3,000 PSI. They are positively buoyant, which we will speak into in a minute. A lot of them come in different paint colors and schemes, but that paint hides corrosion, eventually bubbles off, and they look kind of horrible. And they're heavier by volume. The steel tanks are thinner sidewalls because they are made out of steel. Aluminum tanks have a much thicker sidewall, so there's more material. Next slide. Hmm. So the aluminum tank is heavier than the steel tank. It is. I've got some data here you guys can look at. Yeah. Surprise. Yeah. Yeah. Don't feel yeah. like it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, go ahead. Aluminum Looks. is a light, pretty, uh, oh, well, it's not much, but dense metal, I think, came out of line. Okay, so talking about working pressures. What is working pressure? Working pressure is what that tank is rated for its size. So if I have an aluminum 80 that is rated at 3,000 PSI, which means at 3,000 PSI, that tank has 80 cubic feet of air in it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. You have high pressure and you have low pressure. So like I said, 
on average, most aluminum tanks 3,000 PSI. Some go up to 3,500 PSI and it varies. But the takeaway, high pressure, it can be harder to achieve a full fill. On the other side of things, low pressure. So a lot of steel tanks, they operate in that range of 2250 plus or minus 10 percent. And what that means is, if I have a steel 80 and an aluminum 80, the aluminum 80 rated at 3,000 psi, I need 3,000 psi to get a full fill out of that tank. If I have a steel 80 at 2250, at 2250, it's got 80 cubic feet of, tank of air in it. More air, less volume. Does that make sense? Yeah. Tank okay. takes more space. Yes. Yes. So they both have the same. In same amount of air. Yeah. yeah. Smaller package. All right, so the volume to pressure formula. Now this plays in when you start getting into the overfill uh, conversation, whether you're gonna overfill it by 10%. Uh, and then also, you, have you ever noticed, um, tank might be advertised as a 120, but when it's full, it's actually like 116. Ever notice that? No? Okay, we'll talk about it. Next slide. Everything plus or minus. Yeah, can I touch for a Yeah, absolutely. Don't get caught up on the PSI. The more PSI, the more volume. Everybody gets caught up in this little thing about the PSI. Oh, I got 3,500 PSI on this tank. Yeah. No, that's not, that's not, the volume, the internal volume is going to be the same. Like he was saying, you have a low pressure steel and a high pressure aluminum. They both have the same exact internal volume, 80 cubic feet of air, right? Both of them have 80 cubic feet of air. Just because the low pressure is 2250 PSI doesn't mean that the 3000 PSI bottle has more air in it. It has nothing to do with it. It's the internal volume that you're talking about. And the cool thing about steels is they have, as long as they test it, when you take them out for hydro and they pass it, you can do a 10% overfill on that. And a 10% overfill on a, a steel 2250 tank is going to bring it up to almost 100 cubic feet, a little bit less than that. But so now you have a smaller package with even more volume inside. So don't get caught up in the higher the PSI. Everybody does that. I see them on the tank. Well, I got 3,500 PSI. Well, yeah, I got a bigger tank, you know? So it really has nothing to do with the, the PSI as far as volume goes. So 10% so overflow gives you 20% more air. Uh, I'd have to do the exact math. It depends well, on the tank. you go from 80 to almost 100. I'd have to do the math, yeah. It's 25% more air. Yeah, I'd have to do the math. The big thing is, is when you're working with that low pressure, you get a lot more for just a little bit more pressure. If I have an 80 cubic foot tank at 3,000 PSI, if I bump that up to 3,300 PSI, I'm not really gaining a lot of volume. But if I have a 2,250 and I bump it up to 25, you're getting a lot more cubic feet for the space. And like uh, diving out here a lot, I use low pressure doubles. Um, I've got various sizes, but um, I have a pair of double 130s. So they're 260 cubic feet of gas by volume it slowly trickles down from 2400 PSI all day long, but there's more air on my last dive than an 80 at 3000 PSI, and there's only about 900 PSI in my tank. Okay. And one other thing that's nice about the low pressure tanks is it's easier on your first stage on your regulator. So your regulator is meant to be able to take all the way from like zero PSI up to 4000 PSI. Well, if you keep it in a lower range, that's easier on it. You know, it's like revving your engine. You rev it real high, it's going to be hard on the engine, right? So the regulator's having to do less work when it has lower PSI. You still have the same amount of volume in the tank. It's great. You still get to breathe this as long, but it's less work. It's, it's less harsh on the, the first stage regulator than up at the higher PSIs. Okay, good. All right, so talking about buoyancy versus ballast. Talking about, um, I mentioned how the steel tank is lighter by volume, right? So this, uh, this data was pulled off of uh, basically just a list of, of tanks and, and tank data. So a standard Catalina 80 tank, its dry weight is 31.6 pounds. That's sitting there on the ground. It's not too bad, right? And that's kind of the industry standard. However, that tank has different buoyancy characteristics in the water. The air inside has weight to it. So a full tank has a negative buoyancy of 1.8 pounds. So if you were to throw it in the water, it would sink. Right? But as you breathe that tank down, that tank becomes four pounds positively buoyant on the empty side of things. So if you started your, weight, your dive with 10 pounds of lead weight to sink you, as that tank became more buoyant, well, now you kind of need more weight to keep you down, if that makes sense. 
all the tanks across the board, they have a swing in, in, in buoyancy characteristics as you, as you deplete the air. The di big difference between steel and aluminum is that goes positively buoyant. As you can see here, Catalina 100, uh, 46 pounds compared, compared to a PSD HP 100. That's almost a 10 pound difference, eight pound difference, I'm sorry. All right, and same thing here. Starting the dive, you're negative 7.8 pounds. Ending the dive, it's almost neutral. So you've lost seven pounds of negative buoyancy throughout the period of that dive. And mind you, this is on the extremes where nobody's diving to zero on the pressure gauge here. Okay, on the steel side of this, this is a Faber 72. This is the, you know, Grandpa 72. Dry weight's 28 pounds, negative 8.45. It's still negative at the end of the dive with less air in it, but it's still negative, and that's the key. You don't have anything lifting you up. And again, for the HP 100, 34 going in, dry weight, negative eight pounds, and it's still negative 1.3 pounds at the end of the dive. Make sense? So a couple of things with this steels, good for dry suits, thicker wet suits, right? If you happen to be a, a buoyant person just by nature, uh, which we do have a few of those. Steels will benefit you because you don't have to wear as much weight on your waist or stress your BCD with the weight integrated BCDs uh, with the weights, right? Because they're going to be negatively buoyant even at the end of the dive. Believe it or not, you take an aluminum 80. We can grab that aluminum 80 out of that tra trailer. It's not here right now. An aluminum 80 out of the shed and drain all the air out and throw it in that pool right now. It float. As heavy as it is, you throw it in the pool empty, it's going to float. So think about that when you're diving. You go in, it's heavy, right? You throw it in the pool full, and it's going to go to the bottom. You go in the dive, you're perfectly weighted. At the end of the dive, you come back up, you only got two, 300, 400 PSI in it, you're going to be positively buoyant. And so you're going to be fighting to stay down. That's kind of important. You don't want a safety stop. Maybe you have a deco stop or something. You don't want to blow that, right? You don't want to go straight to the surface. You want to do that conservatism and, and do a safety stop. So you have to overweight yourself a little bit with the aluminum tech steel tanks, you don't have to worry about that because they're not going to be that, they're not going to have that positive buoyancy at the end. So it's going to be a bit more stable, a little easier to deal with as the dive goes on, especially if you're down for a long time. Right, right. When we were down at the quarry, I got down, I, well, first of all, I wore ankle weights, and then when I got up to 700 PSI, I popped back up. So if I had a steel tank, that would probably not happen. I might not need to wear the ankle weights. Uh, yes. If yeah. you notice, so comparing size, you notice that there's still a seven pound swing between the two. That's the volume of air. That air has weight. And we're talking 100 cubic feet of air pressurized. We're talking about seven pounds. That's the difference, right? The difference being that in this particular case, and this is just for an example, we're much closer to neutral. But if we talk about like a standard 80, this is what most people are diving, that's four more pounds pulling you up at the end of the dive versus you're still negative three pounds. So yeah, a lot more, a lot problem. more stable. I had the same problem at the quarry too. It's, it's tough with students, student. yeah, it's tough yeah. with students because it's hard to get your weighting down. Once you become right. an experienced diver, you're gonna figure out exactly what you need to be perfect at the end of the dive. And a lot of times when we do teach, at least when I teach, at the end of one of the dives, I'm gonna drain your tank down 200 PSI and we're gonna do a weight check and we're probably gonna get you nailed down right there. And that way you know what you have to do the rest of the dive. Patty, I love Patty, don't get me wrong, but Patty says to do the weight check at the beginning of the dive at mask level with a normal breath. Well, that's not exactly perfect weighting because that four pounds of positive points that you're going to have at the end of the dive when that tank is empty is, um, is, is, not, a com is not compensated for with that weight check because you're doing it at the beginning of the dive with a full tank. So you're using that air. It's weird that air weighs, isn't it? But when you compress it, it definitely has weight to it. So probably what you want to do is instead of a full tank, it's a nearly empty tank. Right. So at the end of one of the dives, it would behoove, even now, if you guys are trying to get your weighting down, at the end of your next dive, go up to where you can stand and do it safely, and hit the purge valve on your regulator, run it down to 200 PSI. I wouldn't go much below that because at that point, then it probably would need a visual inspection. Run it down to 200 PSI and do your weight check there. That's where you want to be mask right at the eye level. The water should be right at eye level with an empty BCD and a normal breath in your lungs. Just a normal breath, not a real deep breath, not a shallow breath, just a normal breath. And you should be right here, hovering the water level should be right here. And that would be perfect buoyancy. 
so flipping that, because I, I dive with students who haven't got, maybe this is their first ever water dive, college students. It really should be probably over your head if you're starting, you know, if you're trying to check your should be, Yeah, you should be negative. You should be at eye level. You should definitely be negative, like buoyant, yeah. if they're getting it about, yeah. I mean, because if you're an aluminum 80, because that's four pounds, you got to think about it. If you're right level here with a full tank, add, four, add, add at least four pounds, because you're going to lose four pounds of just exhaling the air throughout the dive. Any questions? Any more questions? So what's the, what's the, um, obviously you're steel, you favor steel. Yeah, yeah, so <laughs> he, 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 yeah, no, he touched on it earlier. As far as, okay, so steel tanks, when they start to have issues, they get water inside them, they rust. He said, he gave all the technical crazy compound words for it. It's just <laughs> rust, okay? And when they start rusting, rust is hard to stop, okay? You can stop it. With a steel tank, you got to do a whole tumble with it and everything. It's a process. As long as you're getting good air fills from a good, reputable shop, you should have no problem. The air is super dry. Aluminums, they start to corrode a little bit on the inside, but it's not rust. And it's very easy to stop that process. As long as you take the moisture away, that process stops. And so aluminums are much more resilient to the issues that you can have with tanks. That's why you're going to see aluminums at like the tropical locations, because that's all salt water down there, right? Think about hip gear, we're kind of brackish. Fresh water, steels are, are great up here. You don't see a lot of steels down there in the salt water. Salt and water and rust now, oh man, it just mm. takes off like crazy. And if you ever had any kind of stainless or steel around salt water, man, it's just like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I like the steels because I can pump them up a little bit over the working pressure. Not crazy. I mean, it's not like we're stressing them out or anything. Get a little extra volume. I don't have to wear all the extra weight that I do with the aluminums. Um, but we're not down in the saltwater area, so it's kind of uh, geographic specific, I guess you could say. Um, but the aluminums, and they're much less expensive. The aluminums are much less expensive, um, and they're the most common. So we use them for classes. You know, if somebody drops on and dents it, I can toss it out and replace it for, you know, probably a third of the cost of a steel tank. So it's much cheaper than going with the uh, the steel tanks. Um, nothing wrong with either option. You just we're just kind of going over the different things you should think about when you do have different types of tanks. And aluminums definitely are going to make it positive with buoyant. So Bonaire will have aluminum tanks. All aluminum tanks. Yep. Yeah. All aluminum tanks. Is, is it safe to keep their tank stored full? Yes, you can keep them stored full. The where where the sustained load cracking issue comes into effect is the 6351 alloy tanks that he was talking about earlier. That's the pre 1989 tanks, and basically. What they did is they put the, the alloy that they used when they made these tanks had a little extra lead content in it and under a sustained load, that's why it's called sustained load cracking, over a long time that lead would coagulate together into an area where it was thicker and denser and lead in that one area and then eventually the crack would form the, in the neck of the tank. And a lot of times it wasn't caught in hydro, it wasn't caught, it was caught when somebody was filling in the tank and it would either burst a couple people in Florida died from it. And so DOT came out and said, we're not going to make you bring them all back in, but now it needs a special test. And there's a special machine, expensive machine we brought, uh, bought that sends an eddy current. It's basically electrical current down each thread. And if that current is, um, is interrupted at any point, it shows as a crack on the graph. And we have to do that every, every tank that's pre-89. If you want me to do a visual inspection, it gets it every single year. That's why there's an extra fee, because it's an extra 20 minutes of me setting up and calibrating it and doing everything else with them. And at some point, guys, I mean, it just really doesn't make any sense to keep on paying the extra for those old tanks. It's not worth, number one, the safety. Number two, the extra you're paying every year. Just get a new tank and don't worry about it. Then you don't have to worry about the safety issues. You're not going to be paying the extra $12 per year for for the extra um, test and everything. So is that for every aluminum tank prior to 1980? No. Oh. Um, the, there That's are the several one specific one. ones. Luxford was one of the ones that was the most commonly found that had that issue. Um, there were a couple other ones. Highmark had a couple. Um, the other one that starts with C and I, it's not Catalina. Catalina was not affected by it. They did not have that alloy. Um, so just because I got a little bit tank doesn't necessarily mean it's a... No, however, a lot of the shops that aren't as up to speed with things as they should be will probably tell you that if it's pre-89, they're going to make you take the test. And 
That's if that's their policy, they're, they're going to make you do it. I won't if it's only if it doesn't apply to your tank. I'm not going to make you pay for the test because it just wasn't made out of that alloy. So there there is a list of them, but 99% of them we see come through our Luxfords, and that's what they were, and they, they definitely apply to that. And I have seen we've I've condemned probably a dozen tanks come through here that that definitely had cracks in them. And you're not going to be 99% of the time. It's not going to be you that's going to be affected. It's going to be me while I'm filling. Yeah. And so you, the test is getting done. So <clears throat> dangerous little situation there. And honestly, I mean they're so old. You can get a new aluminum for 189 bucks. I mean really, it's just get a new tank. Safety wise, it's the best way to do it. So sorry. Oh, I, you're fine. Like I said, dialogue. <laughs> All right, next slide. Talking a little bit about valves. Um, standard yoke valve on top, those are the ones we see most common, there's no threading on it whatsoever, it's just that o-ring capsulated on the end and your yoke regulator fits down over top of it, okay? Very common now, you're seeing uh, more of these DIN, uh, DIN fitting regulator valves uh, that we talked about a minute ago. Uh, you hear the term 200 bar and 300 bar valves, what does that mean? Um, in a nutshell, the 300 bars uh, were very common to the PST uh, manufactured tanks in 87. Those are the high pressure steels at 3500 PSI. Big difference between it, had a much smaller neck valve at the base. Uh, so those tanks are kind of proprietary to those valves. You still see a lot of 300 bar valves out there. Uh, every now and again, I've got a set on one of my doubles. Um, but the big difference between the 300 bar valve and the 200 bar valve is that they're shorter. A 300 bar valve has what, seven threads? Seven, oh, th seven, seven threads on a 300 bar valve versus five threads on it? Yeah, so yeah. So the, the big thing with that is some of the regulators won't seat down it. The regulator has to be long enough on that thin piece to actually seat back on the back of it. And there are some, some of the deco rags and cheaper rags, like the piston style rags, they won't even seat on the back of it. Right. So what you see very commonly now that everybody's going to is a 200, a 200 bar pro valve, which is this tank, this tank valve here. So what this is, is a DIN valve with an adapter that screws inside, capsulating an O-ring on the inside, allowing you to put your yoke regulator on the outside. With an Allen wrench, you can pull that out and convert it over to a DIN, and it's a pretty easy transition. The reason this will not work in a 300 bar is because the length of that neck is about an eighth of an inch to 3 sixteenths of an inch longer, so it doesn't hit bottom. Next slide. All right, talking about redundancy. This is something that's become a lot more common um, as diving practices have changed. I know when I started diving in 2000, buddy system was very, very predominantly in effect and in force. Since then, people have gone to using doubles and pony bottles. Technical diving has become a lot more common. Um, and with that, that redundancy, you're taking your buddy with you. Uh, the set on the left is a set of doubles. As you can see, they have an isolation manifold in between. Uh, so basically, that the air on the left tank is shared with the air on the right take through that isolation manifold. Uh, during different types of air emergencies, you can isolate one tank from the other. With that, you have obviously two regulators on top, two first stage regulators, and then each of those has a, a secondary regulator coming around to you. Um, this allows you to carry more volume and be completely independent redundantly. Um, the, the configuration on the right is a pony bottle. So it's a smaller tank, mounted on the side with its own independent regulator. It's kind of like an adapted version of the spare air. Everybody remember seeing those big about 10 years ago? A small little boat, bottle about this big with a mouthpiece on the top of it. So people are carrying these just as a, as a last resort. Now, in my opinion, and I'm not saying I'm right, but with a pony bottle, it is not a extended air situation. It is not going to prolong your dive by taking more air with you. It is just a safety in the event you were to come into a low air situation, you should be planning to exit the dive anyway, but you have a safe, redundant set of air. 